Let's see. I'm not getting anything. Why are we having such problems tonight? We getting okay, it looks like we're getting stuff. Okay. I am very sorry guys. Uh tonight is uh been an interesting one. Um I was trying to say I had a total system crash right as I was about to hit go live. So yeah, that's not good. Um so what I was saying was uh <laughs> Brian had to tell me I didn't have audio. I'm having to work off my webcam tonight, so gonna have to go back to being a little bit old school. Um, I did happen to have a little size 20 fly in here and was going to joke with you guys that we were going to tie a size 20 tonight. Um, no, I'm not going to make anyone do that. Just doing a little midge pattern um, that I had seen. So tonight we are tying a CK Nymph. Uh, awesome fly. It has CK in front of it, so we all know that's a Chuck fly. Uh, this actually is one of his first patterns he ever developed. Don't quote me on the date. 1965 is the date, as I remember, um, that Chuck developed this fly. So this is old school. This is way back when. It might have been early 70s. It's still, you know, we're still talking. Still talking long before my time. Um, you know, Chuck developed this fly for the Jackson River. So it was developed as a trout fly as... Anybody can look at this thing and kind of tell. It probably catches bluegill pretty well. It catches bass pretty well. It, 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 it's one of those all-arounders. And it adheres to Chuck's philosophy of three materials or less. So the materials we've got are a mallard flank. This is a dyed wood duck mallard flank in the back. He used real wood duck, but um, I can't get it. And um, well, what I can get, I don't want to pay for. And then he also has got on there... The good old, uh, this is actually, the body material on this is yarn, um, is acrylic yarn. And then this is actually, the hackle is not your normal hackle. This is what I call a woolly bugger hackle. It's number two hackle. So, uh, but these are tied everything from about a size six on up to about a 16 or an 18 typically. So let me just do one thing first because I can't see. Hold on, I'm trying to be able to work. There we go. I'm trying to be able to also see the chat. Um, I need a bigger monitor. So just gonna, you know, this is what we're gonna do tonight. So I'm gonna start out with this fly. Talk about your hook choices. I gotta find my other hooks. Man, tonight is just not going the way I intended it to. Um, what happens when you take a month off? So I do have to thank Brian. He uh, took over for me for my last from the last time I was supposed to present, I was not feeling well. Um, luckily, don't have anything nasty, but, you know, just wasn't feeling well, and Brian, Brian took over for me. I got to thank him for that. So I'll start out with the hook that we use. I'll talk about that. I Typically, you're going to use a 2X long hook, and I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this with all the glare you're going to get off this. This is actually a Tiemco hook. Um, I'm a big fan of Tiemco. Um, I also like Umqua. Yep, Brian mentioned that Chuck always said a bigger fly. He literally, I remember a story, and I can, you guys know I can always tell Chuck stories. Him sitting in my shop and me saying, I fish a size 16 for brook trout. And Chuck said, I bet you we can go up onto North Fork of the Mormons, which for both of us, we both loved that stream. He goes, I'll let you go ahead of me. You can fish your 16s and 18s. I'll go through with a size eight and out fish you every day. And I bet him, I told him, no, you wouldn't, no, you wouldn't. And finally I said, Chuck, the difference is that I'm going to cheat. I'm going to stomp through the pool so that you can't win. And of course he laughed because he knew that I actually probably would do that. Um, I got to win any way I can because I knew he was probably right. Um, and I won't lie. I really do fish a lot of eights and sixes, but getting back to it, I'm a big fan of the Tiemco brand. Um, and the Umqua brand, I've got some personal loyalties to them. The, uh, one of the owners of Umqua lives down the street from me, or eh, about a mile away from me. Um, good guy. Hook I'm actually going to tie this on, though, tonight is a fire hole. This is competition hook. They call it the foam nymph hook. So it's a 2X long nymph hook. It's a little lighter 
um, than typically I like to use. I typically like to use a 2X Heavy. Uh, one, for it to be heavier. Two, for when I hang bottom, less likely to bend a hook. But this fire hole doesn't have a barb on it. Tamco's have a barb. I'd have to crush a barb. I don't feel like doing it. I'm going to tie on the fire hole tonight. So, put our hook in. Now let's talk about material. I mentioned yarn. And I'm not kidding. Quite literally, this is what I use. That is a full skein. Cost me $3.29. I have about 38 lifetimes worth of fly material here. So, I always tell people, like, if you're going to do this, maybe get a couple of buddies and go in together. Um, because, I mean, like I said, this is 38 lifetimes worth of material. They do make packs that are smaller. Um, I've got one of the smaller ones. It's got all kinds of stuff jammed up in it right now. Smaller, it's black, but this is just acrylic yarn. This is the cheap stuff. This is not the expensive stuff you get at the yarn shop. Go into Michael's, go into Hobby Lobby, go into, well, whichever ones are left, I don't even know. Go into the yarn section and pick out a few colors. I am a big fan of always, I've always got yellow with me. I generally got olive. I can't find my olive at the moment, but I know I own one. Black, of course, because those are two primary colors. I did pick this one up the other day. This is like an orangey. Um, actually, I'd call it Virginia Tech orange. Um, yes, it is. It's what I call it is a Virginia Tech orange. It creates a really cool looking fly. Um, and actually, I would love to go up onto the South River in a few weeks. Yeah, Walmart too. Wherever you get the, uh, wherever you can get your yarn the cheapest. They do make packs that are multicolored, where it's like, you know, black that turns into red, that turns into yellow, that turns into blue, what, you know, whatever. If you want to get one of those, that's fine. Um, just get one with colors that you like. This is a fly that does not have specific colors. You know, olive is traditional, yellow is traditional, a brown is traditional, black is traditional. But traditional doesn't always have to be. Because um, like I said, I got this. It actually creates a fly that looks like this. So it's pretty bright orange. And this thing looks like an October caddis. And October caddis are a really cool species of caddis. They're almost like a stone fly in the way they uh, hatch out of the water. They actually molt in the water instead of coming up to the surface. And they'll crawl out. Well, the nymphs, start when they start moving around, they break loose of the shore or break loose of the rocks, drift down. That's what that looks like. October caddis hatches, one, they're huge. October caddis are some of the biggest caddis that we have. And of course, if anybody knows, I love big bugs. Um, two, give you an idea, my last October caddis hatch on the South River, the fish were literally jumping out of the water to grab the flies out of the air. I put on an olive, not an olive, an orange stimulator and truly was trying to figure out how to set the hook midair on fish. Yes, that's right, midair fish. That's cool. Um, so other materials that we're going to use, um, and actually I will talk about this one. Here's another body material. Uh, I have yet to ever fish this. I truly just saw it on a Tenkara site. Yeah, that's jute. That's literally jute twine like you use in your garden. Um, creates a brown. I don't know. I'm going to have to play with it and see. I'd seen it get used in a Tenkara site and was like, hey, that's cool. I'm going to have to try that. Um, the other materials that I've talked about in, you know, when we talked about, you know, what is what you can use, this is embroidery floss. You can get this for pretty cheap, like buck 29, I think, for this. Um, again, of course, you can get it in multiple colors. The thing I don't like about using this is it's not furry. It gives you a nice, flat, smooth body, which if that's the look you want, cool. This fly really, you kind of want that fuzzy, a bit of fuzzy that the uh, Antron or the acrylic will give you because that'll help, you know, kind of be buggy. Fuzzy is buggy. So other materials that we use, Allard Flank, this is dyed wood duck, or Mallard Flank, natural. Um, so that's really the main stuff along with your lead wire um, lead free, lead. I've actually got the real deal lead here. Don't ask me why. And yeah, um, the original probably was tied with wool. 
Um, I mean, if you've got wool yarn, cool. The uh, acrylic is really cheap stuff. Um, it's a generic hackle. It's not good quality. Don't be going into your dry fly hackles for tying this fly. You want to use what they what they used to call a number two, what I typically now call a woolly bugger hackle. Um, so the same hackle you use for a woolly bugger. And I'll talk about which ones to use when we get started. Um, because it's not your normal setup. So to start off, I'm going to grab my, this is quite literally lead wire. So this is 020. For an 8, typically I'd use like an 025. Um, but it's what I've got, and there's nothing wrong with that. So I'm going to go ahead and put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We're going to go for an even dozen tonight. So, even dozen wraps, get it about middle, slightly ahead of middle, and then because this is lead, I'm going to do something that I was taught when I was a kid. You take your head cement, you encapsulate the lead. Does this really help with getting lead, you know, keeping that lead from getting into the water? Probably not, but it's what I was taught. It's what Mr. Shelton taught me. So, next thing I'm going to use, I'm going to use black thread for this. Six op thread works fine. Um, you can use yellow thread. Uh, should have some other colors in here. Your browns work. Um, really thread color. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with black tonight just because I kind of want the look of a black thread. So, we're going to start up near the front, right behind the eye. Then I'm going to do really light wraps. Now, one thing that I don't think I've ever really taught you guys, and I don't know, is how to wrap down onto lead. If you watched how I did that before I cut off the tag end. Oop, it's drying. I took the tag end, so this part that's in my left hand, see this end, um, and I held that down, and that actually kind of helps to hold the thread up from dropping down in between before I can get good wraps along the back side. And then I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I cover up all these wraps as best I can. Um, while, if you look, I'm also kind of trying to make a bit of a cigar shaped body. That is something about this fly. The under wraps are the key. So like I had said, this is just your plain old six aught thread. So first thing I'm going to put in, since I'm going to do, I think a yellow tonight, since I think that'll pop a whole lot better than anything else tonight. I'm going to do a yellow with a natural, if I can get that word out, mallard flank. So this is a natural mallard flank feather. Super, I mean, cool thing with these is if you can see the barring in them. This tail looks very mayfly-like. Um, and that's one thing about this fly I didn't really talk about. What does it imitate? Well, it's kind of got a bit of a mayfly -y tail. Um, it's kind of got the body of a, you know, caddisy. The fuzzy is, I don't know. Um, the hackle, I don't know what it really looks like. But the cool thing with this fly is if you look, it's tied in a round. So no matter which direction, it should theoretically look basically the same. Flies that are tied in the round, or at least nymphs, have some advantages, some disadvantages because they don't look quite as natural, but in advantages when they're rolling down the stream they're providing the same basic look for the fish. And these, hopefully, if you're going to fish them, you want to fish them down low. You want these things deep. I will oftentimes fish these with, if I just put the lead wraps on them, I'm going to fish them with split shot. Um, you can put a bead on here if you want. You can tie this on a jig hook if you want. I have tied them on a jig hook. I kind of got scolded a bit by Chuck for tying it on, on a jig hook one day. 
I laughed. I, you know, one of those things where I'm just like, eh, Chuck, I'm going to tie it the way I want. So just one of those moments. So what am I going to grab? I'm going to grab this tail. I'm going to grab, what is that? Maybe 10 fibers or so. Not a lot. Um, and I'm actually going to, going to grab them and I'm going to kind of spin them around in my hand a little bit to get them to not all be going in the same direction. So I want this tail a little bit more than half a body length. So if you look, it's about half a body length. Tie it in. And now if you look, I'm going to wrap all the way towards the front. Why do I wrap all the way towards the front with that piece? Same reason why when we're tying a woolly bugger, the tail generally gets wrapped all the way up the body. So you don't get a big butt. So this back section, if I only tied in right here, this whole fly would likely end up with a very big section, very big bump in the back. That doesn't look good. Um, it's something that when you're learning to tie, you make that mistake a million times. When you've been tying for approaching 30 years, you still make that mistake regularly. I do it all the time. Um, so now I'm going to go in. Hey, guys, literally, I can tell you where I got this uh, patch. This came out of the beginner's fly tying kit from Orbis. That's right. They had given me one um, when they came out with the new kit, which I think they've recently even updated that. Most of everything ended up in your healing waters box, except for, um, I won't lie, this. This was about the only thing that I was like, ooh, I can use that. Um, they gave me one in order to test out when they came out with it so that we could be able to talk about it. Being a fishing manager, they that was kind of the cool thing. So what am I going to grab? I am going to grab a hackle that if I could measure this, and I'm looking at it. If you ever heard about measuring a hackle, it's you literally take it, come around, and you want the ends of the hackle to be about where the about where the point is. I'm massively over that. Um, this hackle is about a size four or a two. This thing's a big hackle. You'll see what we're going to do with it. Um, and really, this is one of those situations where you get a hackle that is just too big, put it off to the side, tie yourself a CK nymph. I'm using a grizzly because I love grizzly hackles. Um, I believe that's actually what Chuck always said to use anyways, or a dun. Um, I never heard of him using like a brown or a black, but it wouldn't shock me. Um, one of these days I need to sit down uh, with Tracy or with Chris and ask him a few questions. Um, Tracy Kraft or uh, Chris Riley, both of them, well, obviously Tracy Kraft grew up with Chuck and Chris grew up across the street and Chris is a good buddy of mine. So now I'm going to tie in. I am going to tie in on my side. Well, you know what? I'll tie in on your side. I'm wrapping back up towards the front. Want to cover up my wraps. Go back to the bend of the hook, right at the start of that bend. Okay, now I need some yellow. I don't have any already pulled out. So pull out and I'm going to pull out far more than I need because I got 38 lifetimes worth. Um, So this actually is about a, I call it about a foot um, worth. This is more than I need, especially because guess what the cool thing about this stuff is? It's multiple strands. Now this particular one that I got is super cheap. I mean, it, it really is the cheap stuff. I think I spent seven bucks when I went uh, into the craft store to get all this. And I picked up other stuff that I didn't need. Um, I'm sure the ladies looked at me like I'm a little weirdo. But this actually is, this particular piece is two strands. I don't know if you can see that on the video. It's actually two strands. So really what I'm looking for is a, some, about a sixteenth of an inch in diameter when I'm, when I'm holding it out and stretching it out. I want a little bit of body to this. I'm gonna tie this in.
and I'm going to wrap up and I'm not going to go to the very front. Now, why is that? Because I don't want to crowd the eye again. Like I said, again, because guess what mistake I make regularly when I'm tying this fly? So now, only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this yellow up towards the front of the body. Now, I am going to kind of start in the middle of the fly, trying to overlap my wraps a little bit so that I kind of build up a bit fatter of a body there. Like I had said earlier, I want a cigar shape. So now I'm going to tie it off. I'm right behind the eye, right where I said I didn't want to be. Tie it off close. Hey guys, I still have <laughs> 10 inches. You don't need a whole lot. Um, that's the reason why I said one of these big things is like 38 lifetime supplies. I'm probably just going to end up bringing this with me to the Fly Fishing and Wine Festival and hand it out to some friends who probably need it. Or don't. I don't know, whatever. Um, if we have the Virginia Fly Fishing and Wine Festival, that is a question this year. Um, so everybody knows, or if you don't know, it's in Doswell. Um, awesome event. I've been going to it for the last 15 years. Uh, just going to kind of clean up that head. Um, I hang out. I've got a booth that I'm affiliated with, and I'll be there again this year, theoretically. So now what do we do? We're going to palmer this up, our hackle. So here's the thing. Size 8, 5 wraps. Okay. Size 10, 4 wraps. Size 12, 4 wraps. Size 14 and smaller, 3 wraps. Okay. I distinctly remember getting that, uh, getting that information from Chuck. So I'm going to go for 5 wraps because I'm tying a size 8. Tying a size six, that's going to be eh, five wraps if I remember right. Okay, so there's two. I want these about as evenly spaced as I can get them. I am human. I'm not going to have it perfect. Four. And we'll go a little bit more. So, a couple of wraps. I got a whole pile left. Unfortunately, it's not really a usable hackle. So this hackle now becomes tailing material. So I will say, I would save this hackle for when I'm tying mayfly patterns, because all these hairs here, all these fibers, are good tailing material for tying up some sort of a mayfly pattern, whether it's a nymph or a dry fly. So, I got stuff going everywhere right now. Take our fingers, preen back, wrap in, create a nice little head. And actually, I feel like half itching tonight. There it is. So, interesting thing, most bobbins have a hole in the end of them. Something that I don't think a lot of people realize. I will actually, a lot of times I'll do, I'll sit there and let me do this again so I can show you. I take it, I wrap my thread around the bobbin twice. I then roll the bobbin up, put it over the eye, pull back, we have a half hitch. Theoretically done. One, two, and it's a half hitch. I'm gonna do multiple of them. I'm gonna do three of them tonight. Three half hitches. So I use a whip finish tool. You guys have seen me using the whip finish tool quite a bit. I use a whip finish tool regularly. When I'm tying small flies, a lot of times I'll half hitch them. Um, at least small flies where I've got access to the, whoop, to the front of the hook. A lot of times I'll half hitch those. Why? I don't know. I feel better. Um, dry flies almost always get half hitched. Because with a dry fly, you got all that hackle up in the front, and I can actually use the half hitch tool to push that hackle back. Um, this thing is a great little tool. All it is is a little hole in the end. Honestly, you could take probably a big pen and do the same thing. It just so happens that my bodkin happens to have it. So 
my little needle pokey thing, as some people like to call them, has a hole in the end of it. Honestly, I'd love to tell you I knew where I got this thing, but uh, who knows. The brass is tarnished, so I'm guessing it's at least 10 years old. So, now we're going to cut. And guys, that's almost a finished fly. This is one of those another box fillers. This is one of those ones, hey, look, Jeff, you know, Jeff's tying a box filler. Color is shocked. It's what I, it's what I do. We know that. Um, so now out come the scissors. We got to make this thing look better because all this, that ain't right. That ain't a, that ain't a CK nymph. Here's a perk to your, uh, to, if you've got a rotary vise, I'm going to flip the fly upside down because the first cut I do is on the bottom. And what we're going to do is similar to the CK baitfish Brian did, where you're trying to cut for roundness. I do this a little bit differently on this fly. Bait fish like Brian, I square it, then I then I sit there and round off those corners, and guess what? Now you have a rounded fly. This guy, I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna try to cut right below the hook. Having to blow on it so you guys can see. I'm cutting just below the hook. Okay, and then I'm going to take and I'm going to leave my scissors more or less in the same spot. Just like when you're cutting hair. And now one thing about these fire hole hooks, he's got a really big gape on them. So I'm actually going to shorten it up a little bit. I don't like having all that much hair sticking out. Well, or not hair, a uh, hackle. I'll call it by the right thing eventually. I think I've called it hair multiple times. So, I'm now just going to kind of spin it around. I'm actually going to use my laptop screen as kind of the thing that I focus on. So when I'm trying to go for trying to be able to make it round, I actually am not focusing in on the fly. I am actually focusing in on behind the fly so that literally I'm just picking up the silhouette. And that is what this fly is, it's a silhouette fly. So I'm trying to be able to recreate that look. Oop, that's a great thing to do to your scissors. Why don't you try to cut a hook? But there we go. That is the first one of the night. So I don't even know what time it is. Um, not gonna lie. Hey, we did it in about a half an hour. Um, that included technical difficulties, which again, guys, I'm sorry that I had. Um, I'm gonna have to play with it. It literally, everything worked great earlier today. Everything worked great yesterday. Go to fire up and it all crashed. Um, God, I love technology. I work for a technology company. So last thing that we do, we take our Sally Hansen's hard as nails because, you know, or head cement. Um, I like my hard as nails. And we coat this head. Put the Sally Hansen's right onto our laptop so that we are going to almost guarantee to spill it. And we're going to put a very light coat on. Try not to cover up that eye. I guarantee I will. I'll end up cursing myself. But. That's the first one done. Okay, really guys, basic, simple fly. This thing, it catches fish. This size is awesome. Like I said, I typically am gonna fish this really close to the bottom. We've got brook trout season coming up. You know, we Brian and I have talked about it. You know, we keep talking about it. We had the uh, pre the premiere last week. That was last, yeah, that was last week. Um, Brian did an awesome job with that. Definitely a lot of great info. And you know, one thing, you know, guys got questions, always ask them. Feel free to send them in to Brian. Uh, Brian will then, you know, if he needs me, he'll ask. Uh, but definitely, you know, we can, we'll answer anything for you guys. I also do put up videos every Saturday on our, on our Facebook page. And those oftentimes are going to be uh, teaching videos. We got some cool ones coming up. 
just pointing that out because I've literally got through the end of the year planned out. But that is fly number one. Come on, come on out of there. So, yep, lightning bug nymph. That's, you know, that's a great idea, Brian. I never think to save those fibers for lightning bugs. Um, whenever I tie lightning bugs, I always tie them incorrectly. But you are the master of the lightning bug. So I'm definitely going to be watching that one. I probably will actually be sitting at my vice for that one so I can learn because I will say Brian is a master of the lightning bug. I remember him coming into the shop years ago. So we're now going to tie this one up. We're going to tie up another one. So I'm going to ask the audience. You've seen the four colors I've got available. I've got yellow, which we've already done. I've got the orange, I've got black, and then I've got the jute. I want to get an audience poll of what you guys want to see. So uh, type it in and let me know. I'm watching the chat. While I'm doing it, I am going to uh, put the lead on. Not seeing anything. Don't make me choose, because you're not going to like it. All right, well, if nobody's going to uh, answer, then I'll pick out something. I want to do orange. I thought this color when I uh, got done when I tied with it the other day. I thought this color just turned out so cool. It's one of those. It was one of those like I wasn't planning on buying an orange. I walked in and saw the orange and go, "Ooh, that looks cool. Wonder what that'll look like tied up." So, or more than I need. Pull out. I know that with this particular stuff, I want two strands. So I'm getting two, each time I cut, I'm getting two and then start thinking how many bodies I'm getting out of each one. You know, if you want to tie these things up for Etsy, you want to tie these flies up for Etsy, you can tie up a billion. Um, so. Tie it in again, we're just gonna do our over top the lid. Unfortunately, it is far too heavy a thread because that's actually probably three aught. Oh no, that's six aught. That's six aught thread. That's just really heavy thread. Um, build up our little ramps at each end. Build up a fat little body. You know, you want it fat in the midsection, kind of like me. All right, and I'm going to tie this because of the fact that I did the uh, natural. I'm going to tie this up with the yellow today for this one. So in those packs that you get mallard flank feathers, they're going to have all kinds of feathers. You're going to have big giant ones like we started all the way down to little teeny tiny ones that are completely useless. Well, they're useful for something, just nothing I do. Um. So now I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab actually a bit more on this one. I want to, that's why. Kind of getting a little bit fatter of a tail. I'm, as I'm tying this, I'm not going to lie guys, I'm seeing some, uh, seeing some rainbows coming up after this fly. I don't know why I see rainbows, but I, I see rainbows.
So, half the length of the body, hook gap, eh, something like that. Okay, now I need another hackle. I'm going to actually have to go out and buy a hackle patch because this is starting to wear out. Starting to only have good stuff for uh, tying little tiny flies. and I don't do a lot of little tiny flies like this. You know, we talked about in the beginning, you can tie it down to a 16. I don't fish a 16. Um, I don't fish a 16 for the with these. I fish them up to about a 12 to a 14 at most. I fish a lot of 8s. I fish a lot of 10s. Those are my two predominant sizes. And when it comes to fishing in the wintertime, black and yellow. Don't ask me why the yellow. The black makes sense. Black looks like, kind of looks like a stonefly. This is probably one of the ugliest that I've tied in a long time. But looks like a stonefly of some sort floating down the river. You know, actually this jute probably would look pretty good. Wow, that's got all kinds of... Oh, that's actually all the jute fibers hanging out. So that's the jute. Um, when jute gets wet, it turns darker. Um, Yeah, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. You know what, Brian? You can fish them in chartreuse. And actually, I know that... Uh, I know Chuck fished them in chartreuse. That's another color I totally forgot about. Because there's a million of them. In reality, guys, go into the craft store, buy cheap yarn, whatever color you want, and fish these things. That's really the key. Key to most flies, and I'll give you a hint, fish it. I love seeing one of my favorite questions I see asked regularly on like Facebook fly fishing pages. You know, what is the best fly to throw? And one of my standard responses whenever I see that, and I don't generally answer with this just because I kind of would feel bad at saying it like this, but it's whatever you got on the end of your line that you trust. Faith in a fly is worth probably about two times having the right thing. Sometimes. There are days that actually having the right thing is most important. But having faith, especially when we go up and we hit our freestone streams that we have around us, having faith in that fly is key. Because if you don't believe that it's going to work, you're not going to put it into the right place. Even if you say you're putting it in the right place, you're not going to put it in the right place. And if you're putting the fly into the right place... Most likely on our, especially our small brook trout streams, you're going to get bit. Um, if you're not getting bites, water is either too warm, too low, or your buddy just walked through the middle of the pool five minutes before that. Which, by the way, that buddy would generally be me. Um, like I said, I got to win at all costs. So, you know, don't go fishing with me. I am a jerk with that. Uh, kidding, I don't do that. I actually, when I'm on brook trout streams, I do back and forth. Um, if I ever am fishing with a second person. So it's, you know, basically somebody fishes a pool, catches a fish, next person comes in, you know, and it's back and forth. That's how I do it. It's how I was taught to do it. It's how I believe in doing it. So we've now tied in our, tied in the material, our yarn, you know, this is a cheap material. Don't feel bad about wearing, about using it up. You want to make sure that you cover up everything, though. Don't want to leave a little hot spot. Um, hot spots are for are for new flies, and I don't do new flies. No, I'm kidding. Um, hot spots are are a thing. So one trick, you want to make sure you've got extra yarn. Um, oh, I am crowding that eye. So that you're not trying to get the very little last tip of it and holding it with your finger and eh, that doesn't, that's just not fun. Honestly, guys, if it ain't fun, why are you doing it? Um, this, is, this is a sport where we got to be having some fun. Because it can be the most frustrating thing on the face of the earth. So, there we go. We now have a body, five wraps to the front, 
Looks like I left a little dark section in the back. Oh well. Whoop. And this is why you don't want to crowd your eyes, people. That's two. There's three. There's four. There's five. And yeah, we're going to go with six. Don't tell Chuck. Cut off our hackle. Save that for the lightning bug in two weeks. I totally crowded up that eye. That is going to be so much fun to try to get thread, get. Yeah. Oh well. Totally crowded up that eye. See guys, even I do it. Um, I do it regularly. Again, where do I put my bodkin? Time to finish it. What I'll do is I'll save this fly to hand to a buddy. When I'm catching fish, you know, and I can't, you know, and I'm, I'm and they're like, hey, what you using? You just grab this one and, and hand it to them. So there's three half hitches. Now, also, cool thing if you notice what I'm doing, I'm using the little hole in my bodkin to help brace that fly so that I can pull tight. So that is just about fly number two. Now remember when we talked about trimming this fly up, I generally go for right along the hook gap because these fire hole sticks, competitions, have a really large hook gap for the size of hook that they are. That is almost a six. That is a massive hook gap. I'm going to actually Trim just a little lighter. So this is one of the things you can learn from me is don't go ordering hooks online and not actually really look at them before you start tying with them. Um, not saying I don't like the hook because I do like the hook. I like having a big hook gap. Just don't totally look, not in love with this hook for this fly. In reality, bigger fan of these. So this is a more traditional hook. This is a traditional fly. I'm gonna go with that normally. But if all you got are some is something with a big hook gap, don't worry about it. Who cares? I'll give you a hint. The fly fishing police are not very useful. Um, they're only out on highly fished waters, and um, so that's the reason why I don't fish highly fished waters because I don't want to be around the fly fishing police. You know, I don't want them looking at my cast. I don't want them, you know, looking at my leader that I tied up and judging me. Whenever you see my hand go in front, what I'm actually doing, I kind of go backwards. I'm cupping around it, cupping around the fly, and then I'm blowing on it. So what that does is that takes all these little fibers all the little hackle fibers that I've cut off that are still sticking to the fly and knocks them off. I have some of them all over my laptop right now, which um, I am going to have to clean this thing so badly. I am sorry, laptop. I do care about you. I really do. But, you know, it happens. So, yep. Talked about in the past about flies that create a mess. Eh, this is kind of one of them. Um, luckily, the mess is not too horrible. This is not spun deer hair levels. You know, spun deer hair level is get kicked out of the house, in my opinion. Um, or at least according to my mother growing up. Was, I was told if I, ever, if I ever spun deer hair in the house again and cut it, I would be kicked out. I was 12 years old. I didn't want to get kicked out. I didn't have a job. I didn't have, you know, anywhere to go. So what I'm just doing here, I'm gonna, this fly is going to totally come apart on me. 
Guys, I'm already calling that. This fly is going to come apart on me so bad. What I was just doing there was I was actually uh, trying to clean up that eye. I'm now proceeding to cover completely, cover it completely with with uh, head cement. So now I'm going to use that trick. I think Brian, Brian, you did show this to everybody, right? I feel like you did. You take hackle fiber or hackle feather. You run it up through the eye of the hook. And what that does, and you use the staff, you use the shaft, you use the thick part, you know, as thick as you can get through the uh, through that eye. So if you're fishing like a 22, yeah, you can't get very thick through there, but this size eight's got a pretty good size eye. And you just basically run it up through there, and what that'll do is that'll clean out the eye. Um, of course, now this feather is completely toast. Uh, save that for the next time you completely cover up an eye. You know, hopefully it's that same tying session. But there we go. There's another one. And if you look, that's kind of got that orangey tone to it underneath. That's an awesome little, you know, just an awesome little pattern. I have never fished this color, so I don't know if it's going to work. Um, I assume that it's going to work, but I don't know. Uh, I like it. I have faith in it. If I have faith in it, most likely I'm going to catch fish with it. So that is the key to fly fishing. It's trusting what you're throwing. Um, if you don't trust it, you're going to cut it off quickly anyways. Uh, just from my experience, I don't know how many times I've gone into a fly shop, bought some flies because, you know, the guy in the shop's like, oh, this is what they're, this is what we're killing them with. Cool. Awesome. I fish it for 10 minutes, 15 at most, and go, man, I haven't caught a fish yet on this. Cut it off. Put on something that I trust. Half an hour goes by and I finally start catching, I finally catch fish. Wait, I just gave the fly that I've got faith in twice as much time to catch me a fish. Exactly. That's how it works. If you've got faith in it, you're going to fish it, and you're also going to fish it hard. Um, if you don't trust it, you're going to fish it. You're going to cast it into places that are marginal at best. So just a little piece of advice coming from uh, some experience out on the water. Having trust, having faith is uh, key. Having faith in your flies. Yeah, great little pattern. CK Nymph. We love this little fly. Coming up on that time of year to be definitely fishing it. Uh, fall season is upon us. We still are in smallmouth season. Um, my, if anybody remembers our buddy Matt who did the live stream with us, that was a 23, I believe, that he landed last week. Um, well, he didn't land it. His customer landed a 23-inch smallmouth. Absolute monster. Awesome video of them uh, landing it. So definitely cool. You know, we're definitely still in that time of year. It's still warm out. You know, we've had a couple of cool nights. That's great for brook trout. Um, these cooler nights that we're having, you know, in days that aren't 100 degrees, it's what we need. Need some water to go with it. You know, I know we've been getting some, but we could use a little bit more. But still, you know, can't complain. You know, we're in that time of year where we're going to be able to start fishing for brook trout again. Brian and I this month are kind of trying to get you guys prepared up for that with some flies that you can tie. And these flies will get you all the way through winter. So wintertime brook trout fishing is really cool. It's basically fishing those same spots that Brian talked about, you know, fishing for summertime, you know, for those early season, well, in those September time fish, those deep pools, that's where the brook trout go. It's amazing how the entire stream will dump itself into a couple of deep pools. And then you go out there in like April and they're everywhere. It's like every little riffle, everything, that's where they are. Um, it's a really cool thing to think about the fact that the fish are jumping a foot high waterfall in order to get where they want to go. And you think about it and you're like, this is an eight inch long fish. It just jumped a, its body height and a half. That's cool. So, you know, just wanted to sit there and do that. Talk to you guys a little bit about this fly. Great pattern. You know, one of those ones, we can fill up our boxes with it, tie it up a little bit bigger, tie it up with a bead. Definitely, it's a good idea to tie this thing up with a bead, tie it up heavy. I, a lot of times, will fish this as my uh, anchor fly, if I'm going to fish a two-fly rig. So I'll fish a really heavy CK Nymph 
and then something lighter like a pheasant tail or a hare's ear um, up above it if I'm going to fish a two fly rig. If you guys want to learn more about how to tie up two fly rigs, put it in the comments. Um, yep, Brian. Yeah, Brian's like, yeah, I think we've I think we've taught you that trick. Um, I feel like Brian and I have Brian or I have shown you that one. Um, but you know, if you guys want some tips on being able to tie up two fly rigs, definitely. I mean, you can ask. I will. I can do you know a little bit of that at the beginning or an end of a class if you guys are interested. I fish a lot of two fly rigs, especially in the middle of winter. Um, that helps to give me two kind of water levels. Um, and usually they're only going to be a foot apart, but that still gives me that two different water levels to be able to fish. So if they're on the bottom, I'm fishing the bottom. If they're up a bit, I got the, I got a little bit higher up to fish. So kind of one of those little tricks that I do. Um, but with that, I think I'm going to say, you know, tonight had fun. We tied these up pretty quick. I don't even know what time it is. I'm sure, you know, it's not, it hasn't probably even been an hour yet, but say good night. Everyone have a good time. Remember in two weeks, we're going to be doing the lightning bug. So another awesome brook trout fly. And uh, if you guys got any other questions, you know where to send them, shoot them over to Brian and he will, uh, he'll answer them. And if he can't answer them, he sends them to me. So, and I'll be honest, I don't get a lot of, I don't get a lot of emails from him with that. So he does know what he's doing. All right, guys, have a good one.